Hey, now I won't wait for emergency. <laughs> this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to stand this immediately. My wife and child got badly. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Sir. Road in Allison? <laughs> Sir? You said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Yes, sir. 4147 Moselle Road. Stay on the line with me, okay? Yes, sir. Stay on the line with me, okay? Murdoch, the disgraced lawyer convicted of murdering his wife and son, may get a new murder trial after South Carolina's highest court agreed to hear his appeal of a claim of jury tampering. The jury found Murdoch guilty of both murders after a six-week long trial in March 2023 and was sentenced to life in prison. His lawyers have since argued that a court clerk tampered with the jury, telling them not to trust Murdoch's testimony and to speed up the verdict. They also accused the clerk, Becky Hill, of using the case and the guilty verdict to promote herself a book she wrote about the trial. She has denied any wrongdoing. Miss Becky Hill, who read the guilty verdict out loud at the murder trial, separately faces 76 counts accusing her of improperly seeking financial gain and will appear um, in the state's ethics commission inquiry. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch defendant, indictment for murder, SC code 16-3-0010, CDR code 0116, guilty verdict, signed by the four lady, 3223. Well, there you go, Alex Murdoch may walk free. If the appeal goes his way, he may get a not guilty verdict at the end. What do you think about that? Well, good morning, 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 morning. Welcome, welcome to Crime Vlog Weekly. Hope you guys are doing well again today. Big shout out to returning subscribers, also the new ones. Thank you very much. Don't forget to hit that uh, subscribe button. Also share this video with your friends and family. It is said here, will this killer walk free? He's already been convicted of um, the murder of his son and his wife. Also, he's, he's also been convicted of um, stealing money from his partners and from his clients. But because he was convicted for murder and this uh, clerk of the court is accused of jury tempering, tampering, I should say. He may walk free. Okay, here's Becky Hill being questioned about the allegations of um, misconduct in court. Listen out. Where were we? Oh yeah, we're old friends. I heard uh, that was the microphone that was supposed to. Uh, and you're fine where you are. Absolutely fine. Yes, ma'am. It was a staged microphone. It was obscuring my ability to question a witness. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, what I'm wondering is whether you can be heard without a microphone. Do we need to try to get a microphone um, up I on this podium? Over it, sir. Yeah, that would be good. All right. I don't know who's supposed to hear this other than you, but um, I assume they can hear us. The court reporter, I'm sorry. She's more important, not as important as you. Yes, I agree. Um, oh, yeah, we're old friends, right? We spent six weeks together in a very pressure-filled situation, correct? It was a long six weeks. It was a long six weeks. And um, during those six weeks, you were helpful to me in a number of different ways, um, accommodating friends that I had that wanted to come watch the trial, for instance, correct? That's correct. 
you even allowed me to use the private restroom down on the first floor so I didn't have to stand in line with the rest of the people um, trying to get breaks, correct? Correct. So we have no animosity towards each other. You didn't do something to me and I didn't do something to you during that trial, right? Absolutely. Okay. Now, given that, I'm going to ask you some questions today <clears throat> that may indicate to you that I have um, some antagonism towards you. Let me disabuse you of that. I'm here doing a job representing my client. And you've been around the court system for decades, correct? Yes, sir. So you understand what we're doing here today? Yes. Now, <clears throat> let me understand a couple of things. I think, and I've read your book, one, some editions of your book. There's several. We got a bunch of um, emails in which you have drafts that you forwarded to your co-author, correct? Correct. I believe I would object to relevance. I believe uh, any drafts you sent to your co-author with the book is beyond the scope of this inquiry here today. Overruled. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. And in those drafts, um, you say certain things um, about the trial, about um, the process, which you later did not include in the the final version. It's called editing, is that correct? I would agree with that. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about this book for just a second. It, um, when did you first decide you were going to write a book? I think a thought was there, a very fleeting thought, before the trial. Did you take any steps before the trial or at the initiation of the trial to begin writing this book or working with somebody on this book? Oh, no, sir. When did you and your co-author get together? It was several weeks after the trial. Okay. Did you talk to anybody about the fact you were going to write a book before the trial? There were several uh, anchors and several journalists that I did speak with about the possibility of writing a book. Um, did so disorganized, I apologize. Um, did, do you know, did you seek assistance in this trial from other clerks of court? Yes, sir, I did. And who were they? Rhonda McElveen, who is the Barnwell County Clerk of Court, and Renee Elvis from the Horry County Clerk of Court. And um, did they, were they there with you the entire six weeks? No. I mean, how much, how long were they there? How, how often were they there? Rhonda McElveen was there as often as she could be, probably several times a week. Renee Elvis helped me during the jury selection. Begin working with you prior to jury selection. Can you repeat that question? Was she? We began jury selection, I think, on January 23rd. Correct. Correct. Was she working with you or consulting with you prior to the 23rd? No, sir. Did you have any conversation with her about the trial? Not until she got to the trial. On what? I can't remember the exact day she came. Okay. Now, is she a friend of yours? She was a friend, yes. Was? Well, she is a friend. Okay. Yes. And she's done nothing to make you any less a friend? No, sir. Now, um, <clears throat> did you tell her about the time of the trial that you were going to write a book, that you had thought about and were going to write a book? I can't remember exactly. I I think we did have a conversation about a book possibly in the future. And did you tell her you're going to write a book because you thought it would make a lot of money? Oh, no, sir. You never said that? No, sir. And did you tell her that you were going to write a book to make a bunch of money so you could buy a lake lot and build a house on it? No, sir. Okay. 
Now, did you ever tell her uh, that you had given a juror a ride home, that you had accompanied Mr. Bill, what's his last name? Bill Polk. You're right. Did, that you and he took a juror home one night. Did you tell her that? Did you take a juror home one night? I didn't take a juror home one night. Did no, Mr. Sir. Polk, Mr. Polk, and you take a juror home one night? No, sir, we did. You, you never gave a juror a ride in a car with Mr. Polk or without? No, sir. Okay. Um, now, also, during the trial, um, your, your daughter ended up on the venire, is that right? She did. And um, she was coming up, and did you talk to me and, and Mr. Waters about putting her on the jury, if at all possible? I'm not sure that we wanted her to be on the jury, if at all possible, but um, I think the question was, um, would she make a good juror? And I said, she sure, she sure would. Now, I don't think we asked you. I think you told us she would make a great jury, did you not? I remember you asking. Okay, okay. I was considering putting your daughter on the jury. Yes, sir. And who does she work for? She works for Compass South. Did she work for the Sheriff's Department at some point? No, sir. Okay. Does she work in law enforcement at all? No, sir. Okay. Um, now, let me ask you this. Um, how many jury rooms were there? We have two jury rooms in Colleton. In this trial, how many jury rooms did you have? How two. Many? Okay, so the, the entire jury wasn't together at any one time? They were separated into two rooms? Yes. Okay. And um did uh the when they're separated into uh, two uh jury rooms like that are they next door to each other are they down the hall from each other what? they are next door to each other okay so but if you close the door to one can they hear what's going on in the other one some women probably have very good hearing and men too but i would say probably not okay are there restrooms in both of the jury rooms there are Okay. Where, I mean, are there two restrooms or just one? There's one restroom in each jury room. Okay. Were either one of those uh, restrooms designated men and women, or did everybody use the same one? They were unisex. They were unisex. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, prior to your testimony here today, have you met with uh, the Attorney General's office in SWED? I have. On how many occasions? I want to say twice. Okay. And remember when the first time was? I think the first time was in September. Okay. And the second time was last week? Yes, sir. And that was in Walterboro? Yes, right. And you all spent about four, four and a half hours together? I want to say maybe two hours together. Okay. And in those two hours you went over your testimony here today? They asked me questions. Did they ever correct your answers or suggest you answer differently? Oh, no. No, no. Oh, so no. you just you just went through what you went through in 20 minutes here. It took two hours to go through when you were with them. There were times when I would step out of the room and come back in. Um, but I would say we were there for about two hours. Now, um, you have described in your book your role as Switzerland, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And that is that you should not be in any way um, opinionated about what's going on in the trial, is that correct? That's true. Okay. Um, yet in your book you indicated a number of different points during the trial you had concluded he was guilty, is that correct? I think... Your Honor, I object to this point. I don't know if her conclusions in the book are in any way relevant to what occurred during the trial and whether or not there was any communications with the jurors, which is the sole issue that we're here for today, is whether or not uh, Ms. Hill had any extraneous influence on the jurors. Um, and so I think this is uh, going a little far. We we'll object to the relevance here. Oh, Let me give you an example. You indicate riding back from Moselle that you and three other people were in a car and you all decided adamantly, I think was the word you used, um, that he was guilty, that he had killed his wife and son. Is that what you put in the book? I can't remember if I put that in the book, but if you say I did, then I will did agree with happen? you. Did that happen? We did have a conversation about 
what each of us thought. And they all four agreed that he was guilty, correct? And none of us were jurors. No, no trust me, I know that. Um, but you had an abiding conviction, um, at least by the time of the Moselle visit, that he was guilty. And the other people in the car with you were bailiffs, were they not? No. Who um, were they? Some were not bailiffs. One was a court reporter. One was our um, security officer, head security, and another was a deputy sheriff. Okay. But the four of y'all rode out there, and based on what, and I, I mean, I can, you want me to read to you how chilled you were and how you felt this, that poor Paul and, and, and Maggie had been executed by him on that scene, that visiting the scene convinced you that he was a horrible, horrible murder? You want me to read that to you? Or you will concede that's what you wrote? I will concede that's what I wrote, but if I may, I, will, I would say that, that a lot of that is poetic license um, in writing a book and in well, making it sound like that. Okay, so some of it's poetic license, and some of it you just stole. You, you, you uh, purloined it from that BBC writer, right? Right, and I object to uh, not only the relevance, but the uh, scope of uh, cross. I would object also under uh, Rule um, 608. I don't believe that's appropriate cross examination. Overruled. You may continue, Mr. Harper. Did you steal part of the book? I did plagiarize, okay, Mr. Hartfield. That's stealing, isn't it? And it is. Okay. And for that, I'm very sorry. And I have apologized. Okay. And that makes it okay? What I did, I did. And I apologized for okay. that. And part of the book is, you say, literary license? Exaggeration? I wouldn't call it exaggeration. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Is Switzerland, and this is, you're saying this is happening while you're supposed to be Switzerland, you decided the defendant's guilty. And um, if Ms. McElmean says that it's going to make you more money um, if, you, if he's found guilty, don't you think it's reasonable to assume that you may have crossed the line from time to time? Your Honor, I object to the form of the question, assuming facts not in evidence. Overruled. Can you repeat that question one more time, I'm Mr. Not Hart, repeat really? it. Let me just move on to something else. Um, let, let me ask you, um, you had interactions with some jurors, and I believe um, in a conference in the judges' chambers, um, you indicated that you had seen a post on, is it Walterboro word of mouth? Your Honor, again, I would object. Uh, I think he's delving now into the Facebook inquiry. Uh, we believe, again, that that's irrelevant to the inquiry for Your Honor. I will allow limited, uh, he's, uh, 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 as I understand it, trying to impeach her testimony and uh, 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 explore her credibility. And uh, I think I've already told Mr. Harputlin that I don't want a whole trial about the business of Facebook and the egg juror, but uh, I will allow limited examination on this point. You may proceed, Mr. Harputlin. Am I over oversimplifying that? You, I mean, it's in your book. Um, you saw something on Walter Burr word of mouth, which appeared to you to be from the ex-husband of one of your jurors. Is that correct? Am I oversimplifying that? I remember reading one night something on Walter Burr word of mouth, and when I was in the courtroom on a Monday morning, listening to the judge and the attorneys talking about a matter, it sounded like it was relevant to each other. Okay. And um, you became aware somehow that this juror had a restraining order out for her ex-husband? She told me that herself. Okay. And um, uh, tell me how uh, it came for her to tell you about that. Where did she tell you? She uh, was very talkative. And when I was instructed by Judge Newman to go and get her from out of the jury room with a, a deputy following me, she was talking to me all the way back to the judge's chamber since she mentioned that there were restraining orders out when they had divorced. So how did the judge, who brought it to the judge's attention about this Walter Burr word of mouth thing? I let the judge know thinking that it could be related. Okay, and you let the judge know what? That I had read something on Walter Burr word of mouth. Okay, and that you knew it was tied to that juror? I didn't know that it was. I who, wasn't sure who, at all. Who do you think it was tied to? 
from what y'all were talking about at the bench, um, I felt like I needed to let him know, just in case it was related. There was something about an ex-husband and an ex-wife and somebody being on the jury. You didn't tell the judge that you had found what we call the apology post? You didn't tell the judge that? I didn't call it that, no. You don't remember producing it saying that the, the, it, producing it to the judge saying this is a post in which the guy that posted it on Friday night says the devil got in him and he drinking and he apologized for what he posted. You didn't produce that? My staff did. One of my staff But did. you gave that to the judge and gave it to us, did you not? Yes, we did. As if it were from that juror's ex-husband, correct? Correct. And you know it wasn't? I don't know that, Mr. Hartbullian. No. So, and this, you did not take that juror out and talk to her before you took her to the judge? Is that I, your... I never talked to that juror about stuff like that. Okay. Um, did you ever talk to the forelady of the jury, separate from the jury? I did. Okay. And tell us, uh, where did that occur? When I would go into the jury room and I would speak with the forelady, we would be in like the hallway in the, the, the two jury rooms were side by side and the opening to the jury room went out into the hallway and we would be surrounded by the jurors at all times. Uh, Mr. Bill would be very, very nearby or another bailiff as well when we would speak. And what did you speak to her about? There were several instances. One was um, there was a juror who needed some feminine products. There was another time when Band-Aids were needed. There were times when uh, Tylenol would be needed. Other than items that were needed by the jury's health object, did you ever discuss, did she ever discuss with you, if some issues the jurors had emotionally or some issues with dissension in the jury room? She only told me that there were some loud jurors, and it made some of the other jurors a little upset, but other than that, that's... What did, what did you tell her to do? I told her if it got out of hand to write a note to the judge, and that she could sign the note and get Mr. Bell to give it to the judge, and the judge would handle that for her. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, you did publish a book after, after this trial, is that correct? We did. And you went to New York and took some of the jurors to the Today Show? The, to the Today Show did invite us, yes. Now, one of those jurors um, that went up there with you, the day of the verdict, um, wore, for the first time I can remember, wore a suit to, to court. Do you remember that? Your Honor, again, I would object to discussion of the jurors wearing a suit or a post-trial trip to, uh, to the Today Show. I, I don't believe there's any connection to the inquiry that's that's focused for your honor, and that is whether or not there was any extraneous influence during the course of the trial. I'm going to connect it, your honor. I believe. All right, overrule. May continue, Mr. Hopkins. Did you text, email, or communicate on the morning before final arguments were completed that to people that they this was on a Thursday that they probably, if they're going to see the trial, should come on that Thursday because it'd be over by the, the next day. It would be the jury would not be out very long. Did you ever communicate that, email, text, or verbally? I do remember saying that, yes. And why did you think the jury would not be out very long? Had you communicated with jurors? I had not communicated with jurors about anything related to this trial at all. I've been a court reporter for at least 14 years. I was clerk of court for three. and. You just get to where you kind of um, see things happen as they progress, and it's a guess. It's a gut feeling, and that's, that's all that I meant by that. Well, why are you telling this young man who wanted passes for the next day in an email, um, you know, it won't be happening tomorrow? That was your, or did you say, you didn't say, I don't think. You just said, you better come today if you're coming. Remember doing that? I don't remember that. Um, but, you know, if... 
if he wanted to come. I knew that the trial would be ending shortly as far as testimony. So if he wanted to come, he needed to come. Why wouldn't the jury have been out a week on a six-week trial? They could have. But, but you're, have. you apparently were telling the press and others that it would be a quick verdict. Were that, you not? That was a, just a gut feeling that I had. Okay. And that was my opinion. <clears throat> Your opinion, you were right. The jury was out three hours on a six-week trial, correct? That's true. How much money did you make off that book? There was not a whole lot of money made off of the book after paying different things and um, paying for some expenses that went along with that. But I want to say roughly around 100000 Okay. That's not a lot of money. No, especially when you publish your own book. But that was 100000 you made? Uh, with my co-author. Okay. In, in what period of time? Six months? I would say six months, yes. When was the book published? August 1st. Okay. The um, trial was over That's uh, six months after the trial is over, you've published a book, correct? Correct. <laughs> and then uh, I believe you've recently stopped selling the book because of the plagiarism you've admitted to, correct? Correct. And so there's no more money? Correct. Now, um, you also indicate in the book that the Murdaws had a reputation of um, criminality, I think, is kind of what you put. Did you not? Well, Mr. Hartpooley and my grandfather and Old Man Buster were very close. Well, were they criminals? I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. But you I believed and you published that the, Mur the Murdaugh family had run that part of the state and they would participated in criminal conduct, correct? Your Honor, again, I would object to general testimony about the alleged criminality of this family. I, I'm not sure how that has any bearing on the focused inquiry before the court. He's asking by, about what she said in the book. I'm going to allow it. Yes, sir. Did you say that in the book, that they, they were criminals? In the book, that was more of the, the literary ease that we, that we take, I think, to make a story a little more interesting for the reader. By calling people criminals. I, I guess what I'm saying is this. Were they criminals? Your Honor, again, I object to that particular question. Oh, rude. Were they criminals? I wouldn't know that. Okay, so know. you either made it up or you're lying about it? About the reputation of people that can't defend themselves? They're dead? You're going to call them criminals? You did that in the book so you could sell a book? No, I didn't do that to sell a book. What'd you do it for? Made it more readable, you said? It, Which liter sells literary books. Literary ease. Yeah. What? Literary. Literary what? Uh, the, the literary ease that, that you can take with when writing a book. Literary ease you can take with writing a book? You can make stuff up? You can lie? You can lie about not people? With, not with that. I, I, you know, it's... I think the public perception uh, was one that it was very interesting during this time. So and you're feeding you're feeding the monster out there that wants to believe bad things about the Murdoch's, and you'll make stuff up to do it. Let me give you another example. During I read your book and I found this somewhat humorous. My co-counsel did not uh, in describing Mr. M myself and Mr. Griffin in the book. You say that um, I neutered him. Um, we've both been very con interested in what you meant by that. What do you mean by, I mean, neutering Jim Griffin? Mr. Hartpoolian, it, it was a book. Did you make it up? I know it was a book. The right. Bible's a book. Right. I mean, just because it's a book doesn't mean you can lie in it. It's, it's just a word okay. that was right. used. Make sure that exchange. Uh, don't argue with the witness, but the witness, um, Ms. Hill, you're instructed to answer his questions. You may proceed, Mr. Hartpoolian. So let me get this straight. The book, and I'll see if I can cut to the chase on this. I could read you chapter after chapter, verse after verse, which is not true. Okay? Not true based on my experience of being in a courtroom and not true based on knowing some of the people you describe. You say, you say that is... 
Mr. Hopkinton. I object. The counsel is just testifying right now as to his observations about the book. Question, Mr. Hopkinton, please. You conceded there are things in the book that you don't know to be true, correct? Correct. Okay. You would concede then that you have lied in the book. It's only because I wasn't there at the time. I can't. I can't um, interview my dead grandfather. I can't interview Mr. Buster. There's just things that we can't. Um, interview them on, we can go by what was written in a newspaper and get facts from that. And and take the inference that uh, one of the Murdoch's is a pedophile. You could have printed that and they're not here to contradict it. You could have printed anything you wanted and made it up to sell books. That's what this, this whole scheme was about, selling books. As you told Rhonda McElveen, if, he, if, if him being found guilty would sell more books. Right, Isn't right. that true? I'd object to the argumentative nature of the question, the compound question, and assuming facts not evidence. compound question. Uh, if what you're asking is what uh, she told uh, Ms. McElveen, go on and ask that, but don't proceed it with a yes, uh, testimony. Beg the court's indulgence for just a moment. something we now know probably wasn't her ex-husband. Um, did she have any other ex-husbands that you found out about? I have no idea. Well, you wrote, we learned later the ex-spouses hadn't seen each other in 14 years and she had three restraining orders against him. Did, did she have three restraining orders against him? I don't know. That's what she said. Okay. Um, <clears throat> tell jurors at the end of the trial after President's Day break, President's Day break would have been a Monday, correct? Correct. But before Mr. Murdoch testified, did you tell the jury not to be fooled by the evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's lawyers? Mr. Harpooley and I never talked to the jurors about any of the evidence okay, The answer in this would case. be yes or no, then you can explain. Did you say that? No. Okay. Um, did you, all, did you ever instruct the jury to watch him closely immediately before he testified, looking at his actions, looking at his movements? Did you ever tell a jury to do that? No. Did you ever tell the jury to pay attention to Mr. Murdoch's testimony? To pay attention, not specifically to his testimony. I did tell the jury to pay attention. Um, to what? Just generally in the hallway when I was speaking. Not to him. No. Just any witness. Right. Okay. Um, did you did you ever warn the jurors the defense is about to do their side? This is right before Mr. Uh, right at the, the beginning of the defense case. They are going to say things that will try to confuse you. Don't let them confuse you or convince you or throw you off. Did you ever tell the jury that? No, sir. Okay. Um, did you ever tell the jury, if you get emotional, we want to see your face, because that is what they want to see? Did you ever tell them that? No, sir. Um, did you ever tell the jury that Mr. Uh, Murdoch was about to testify? I didn't tell the jurors that. Now, did you tell the jury that if they didn't reach a verdict by 10 o'clock, they were going to have to spend the night? No, sir, I did not. Did you ever tell them they were going to have to spend the night? At no, some sir. Point? Did you ever tell them?
Well, there you go. Alex Murdoch may walk free. If the appeal goes his way, he may get a not guilty verdict at the end. What do you think about that? Would love to hear your comments. Let me know what you think about this uh, jury tampering allegations. Do you think that should have anything to do with his uh, conviction of uh, murdering his two um, family members, which is his wife and his young son? Absolutely disgusting now. The evidence and the evidence did point to him being guilty. The jury found him guilty um, with overwhelming, overwhelming um, evidence. He lied in court. It was proven in court that he lied. The jury did not believe him. I have got um, clips of him lying in court. Now, along with your emergency. <laughs> this is Alex Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to pass us immediately. My wife and child just got badly. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? <laughs> sir? You said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Yes, sir. 4147 okay. Moselle Road. Stay on the line with me, okay? Hurry. Yes, sir. Stay on the line with me, okay? Okay. Con County Communications. Collison, I have an Alex Murdoch on the line, caller from 4147 Moselle Road. He's advising that his wife and child was shot. Okay, and sir, give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. <laughs> okay. And did you see anyone? Okay. Is he breathing at all? No. No. Is she? Okay. Do you see anything? Do you see anyone in the area? No, ma'am. Oh, ma'am. What color is your house on the outside? What color is your house on the outside? Uh, it's white. You can't see it from the road. Okay. Is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay. And what is your name? My name is Alex Murdoch. Okay. Did you hear anything or did you come home and find them? No, ma'am. I've been gone. I, I just came back. <laughs> Okay, and was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Okay, what is her name? Mag Maggie and Paul. Maggie is her name? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. Uh, we're getting somebody out there to you. Me asking you these questions. Don't slow them down, okay? And you sure they're not breathing? Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? <laughs> Nobody. They're not. Neither one of them moving. What is your telephone number? What? And does anything look out of place? Come I, I, not, not particularly, really, no, ma'am. Okay. Are they close, ma'am? Yeah, they're, they've been in route with you ever since uh, you've got on the phone with me. I have multiple people coming out there to you. Okay. I don't want you to touch them at all, okay? I don't I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't, I don't want you to touch them just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? I, I already touched them trying to get a, um, to see if they were breathing. 
Okay. Well, I, I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? You what you're saying is not accurate. You're saying that you didn't say very specifically to law enforcement that you went to them prior to calling 911. When? After you got out of the car, you told law enforcement repeatedly that you went over and checked the bodies before you called 911. No, I don't. If I did say that, I don't believe that's accurate. Did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. No, sir. That's not, that's not, I don't, that's not accurate. At least that's not what I remember. That's not what you remember saying, or that's not what you say now happens? No, that's not what, that's not what I believe happened. Okay, but you don't deny that's what you said. Did I said, did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. I don't believe that's what I said. <coughs> now, I know I checked them, but I don't believe I checked them before I called 911. Because I, I can pretty well remember vividly when I checked Paul Paul, I was already on the phone with 911. Looking at this data. show the vehicle parking at 10.05 and 55 seconds. Yes, sir. And 10.05.57, the Suburban arrives at the kennels. you agree with that? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, Mr. Williams. At 10.05.57, it shows the Suburban arriving at the kennels. Okay. Okay. The 911 call was at 10.06.14. Okay. Just about 20 seconds later. You agree with that? Um, I think that sounds right. Yes, sir. I mean, that makes sense. But that goes back to what I'm saying is I, I pulled up. Saw. I saw them, and I know I jumped out of my car. Um, but I believe that before I checked them, in fact, I'm almost certain that then I went back and I got my, that's when I went and got my phone and I called 911. Okay. And then, after I called 911, they, they, I mean, there was a little while where there wasn't, I don't, I don't think there was anything going on. And I believe that that is the time period that I went and checked on them. that what you're saying here today, now that we have this data, that's not exactly how you expressed it to law enforcement in your prior statements. Is that correct? No, sir. I disagree with that. Okay. I totally disagree with that, Mr. Waters. Will you point to what you're talking about?
Where's the first one? Alright, sir. Um, I'm not doing the house, but I'm going to watch you. Alright, Mr. Murdoch, um, state your full name for me, please. Richard Alexander Murdoch. Seven, nineteen sixty-eight. Good phone number for you. Eight zero three nine four two one two two seven. All right. Sir. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Hendricks. stated on David Owen and uh, Laura Rutland with Collin County, I'm with SLED. I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't you don't have any problem yeah. with it. So um just start at the top, take your time. Um like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean I pulled up and I could see him and you know I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. And my, my boy over there, I could see it was. turn him over and uh, I don't know I figured it out um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket I started to try to do something with it thinking maybe but then I put it back down really quickly um, then I went to my wife and I, I mean I could see mm -hmm. Did you touch me at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I called 911 um, pretty much right away, and she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and, um... What family members did you call him? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother John. And I tried to call a little 
boy, real good friend that's right around the corner from here, but I didn't get him. The person you didn't name, that was Rogan, the little boy right around the corner. Is that who you're talking about? That's correct. But going back to your question, I mean, that's, that's the way I remember it, what I said right there. And I, you know, your, your question about did I do these things before I called 911, that's not what I said then, and that's not what I remember now. Okay. So you're saying now that you went out, you checked, you came back, got your phone, and that's when you called 911? I'm not saying that now, Mr. Wilson. I am saying that now, but to me, that's what I said then. I mean, I told her I called 911 right away. I didn't have, there was no time to do the things that I'm talking about doing in the, in, in the time between getting there and calling 911. When you talked about calling Rogan and you said that he lived right around the corner, correct? That's correct. Right. But Rogan wasn't staying there at the time. That's the whole reason that Cash was at your kennel, right? You knew that. Well, Rogan was staying in, in Buford a lot, but he was home a lot too. I didn't I didn't know where Rogan was on a daily basis. About keeping his dog cash at the kennels when he was staying with his girlfriend and working down in Buford? Yes, he he had asked me that. But I mean that had been some time before. I didn't know you making a big deal about this, Mr. Waters, but that particular night I, I didn't have a clue where Rogan was staying or not staying. I was trying to find somebody to come out there with me. I'd called Randy, I'd called John, and Rogan was the next best alternative. Okay. And Rogan Whoa. is so close. I mean, Rogan, of, of all these kids that you've heard, Rogan, Gibson, I mean, Roro is like a, a Rogan, you prefer when I call him Rogan, is truly like a son to Maggie and I. And he was such a good friend to Buster, and he was such a good friend to Paul. And you've been through everything I have. You'll see that two weeks or three weeks prior to this, I ran out of gas when Bus and Paul Paul weren't home. And Rogan's the person that I called to bring me gas. Okay. Nobody's disputing him, any that Rogan would have helped you. Let me keep playing this. Around, um, Paul, when you walked up. Blood. Any, any other, anything else? I mean, there was some body mm -hmm. things, yes, sir. I mean, like any other evidence. I know you said the phone fell out of the pocket, um, but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? No, sir, not. No, not good. No, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? No. What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to, my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover and she fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. You just testified that in the wake of this, you didn't know what you said to law enforcement. That was what you just said. No, I mean, I know. I know a lot of what I said to law enforcement, but there's a lot of things in looking back at this video for one, the 911 call for one. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that I didn't remember. Okay. But right then and there, just not long into this interview, You made a conscious decision to lie right there. Play that again? You said I was at the house.
and I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house. Played. You want me to back it up some more? Well, yeah, we can keep listening to it. Anything about him now? What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to my mom's late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover. Okay. She fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. You want to hear it again? No, sir. But I, I don't. So think you made a conscious decision to lie right there, this early into an interview, sitting in the front seat, correct? I don't believe so. I, you didn't make a conscious decision to lie. I don't believe that. I don't believe that was lying at that point. Okay. Tell me why not. Because Maggie had gone to the kennels, and I was at the house. Okay. So you think you were being, that was not a lie at that point? I, I, I don't believe so. At, that at, what, at what point did you decide to lie? I'm not sure, but it was in that. It, it was, was in this interview? I, I believe that it was. Okay. Was well, this interview where you're sitting in the front seat, correct? It is. You're not in custody, correct? I'm not in custody. They're giving you water, letting you chew tobacco, treating, treating you politely, correct? They were treating me very politely. So what was it that they clicked? When did, so you said it's in this interview that it clicked that, I, that I'm going to lie about the most important fact that I know? I'm not sure exactly when in it that I lied, decided to lie, but I, I believe it was during this interview. I, I believe all those things that I talked about, uh, you know, those things that had gone on, the things that people had said to me about don't talk to anybody without a lawyer. Uh, my partners all told me that, or a lot of my partners told me that. My dear friend, Chief Alexander, was one who said that. I overheard, I believe it was Sheriff Hill, I'm not positive, I overheard him tell, I believe Mark Ball or Gray Holmes, don't let him talk to anybody without a lawyer. And what I believe is that based on my distrust of SLED and getting in that interview, and I'm not positive about this, but I believe when he asked me, you know, about my relationship with my wife and my son, I believe that's when I decided to lie. You but I'm not left positive. out when you had the GSR too, because that's what you testified to yesterday. That certainly contributed. And, you, and your dope paranoia too, you said that as well, correct? Well, those things are what triggered the paranoia that started as my addiction evolved. Right. And so you're an experienced lawyer and you've been a prosecutor and you took the advice of your law partners that you should have a lawyer there as you read that as, oh, I should lie. No, that's that's not an accurate. Because that's statement. not what that means, is it, Mr. Murdoch? Well, that, that's not a. That's an, you're not. That's not an accurate statement. What you just said, Mr. Waters. I just repeated what you just said. You said it was one of the factors was your law partners, and now you're blaming Sheriff Hill and, and Greg Alexander told you to, that you needed a lawyer before you talked to police, and you took that somehow as meaning I need to lie. No. As a lawyer and a prosecutor? No, that's what you said, Mr. Waters. Right, but I, I, how I, am I mischaracterizing it from your perspective, Mr. Murdoch? Because, because I think that's, that, that, isn't that what you heard? Isn't that what you just said? Excuse me. No, sir. That's not what I said. All right. So, well, say it again. I believe those guys were trying to help me. I believe they cared about me. I believe they thought that I was in a condition such that I shouldn't talk to anybody. Um, I mean, I mean, those guys had to prop me up, yeah. help me get myself together just to be able to go talk to David Owens. I mean, they were trying to help me. But before that, that was just one of the many things that I believe led to that situation sitting in there where those paranoid thoughts came to me. Them talking about not talking to anybody without a lawyer. Brian Varnado, checking my hands, the fact that I got a pocket full of pills in my pocket. Uh, I was the person who found 
Maggie and Paul. My distrust for SLED. Um, all of those factors combined and made me decide to lie. I also know him asking me about Maggie and Paul Paul contributed to that paranoia. All I'm saying is, I'm not disputing that I lied. I'm just saying at this point, you're saying I made a conscious decision to lie here, and I'm saying I don't think I made a conscious decision right there. Okay. So lighter? I believe so. Had you already had your GSR done at this point? Yes, sir. Okay. I had. And you already talked to your law partners and talked to and heard Sheriff Hill. Now you're blaming him and, and I'm not, blaming uh, no. Chief Alexander now as well for your lies. No, sir, Mr. Waters. Well, you I'm just not, added that one. You didn't say that yesterday. You just added that one. Be given the opportunity to answer the question. Objection. Can you finish your last answer? All right. Mr. Waters, I'm not blaming anybody. I accept full responsibility for what I did. What I'm saying is what I believe contributed to me doing that and the reason why I did that. I think those folks were trying to help me. So I don't blame them. I think they were worried about me. Okay. I don't dispute that, but you're saying you took that advice as I need to lie. Nah, what you're doing is you're isolating one single I'm not thing. I'm isolating anything. I've mentioned all the factors. You've added some new ones, but I mentioned all the factors that you're blaming for no, your sir. decision to lie. That's not what you did. What you asked me is you said I took, I took my partners telling me not to talk to somebody without a lawyer as a reason to lie. And that's an inaccurate statement. That was one of the factors that went into a your series, to lie. hang on Mr. Waters, a series of events all right, that caused me to have paranoid thinking, all right, and then I lied. All right, but at some point it happened during this interview that you, you crossed over. You're saying that you came into this interview intending to be fully disclosing to everything, and something happened in this interview that sent you over the edge, and you said, hey, let me lie about the last time I saw my wife and child alive, supposedly, according to me. I certainly didn't go into that interview, I believe, intending to lie. Mr. Okay. Waters, I wasn't capable at that point in time of planning anything or thinking through anything. So somehow during this interview, all of a sudden, those senses came to you to plan and do that? When I got to thinking in that paranoid way that normally, as I said, I mean, I could take a deep breath and make it go away. I never had a situation where it lasted more than a matter of seconds. That night, after all those things had happened, it, it didn't go away in a matter of seconds. And I decided to lie. Those are the uh, clothes that you ultimately gave to Dave Owen, is that right? Those are the clothes I gave to David Owen. At what point did you get, get, be able to chuck the pills you say are in your pocket? When did you do that? When I was in my bedroom. When you are in the bedroom? Yes, sir. Where would you put them? I'm not sure where I put them, but ultimately they would have gone in my suitcase. So you, that's when you did it? Do you have a specific recollection of that? No, I don't. I just know that I took them out of my pocket. If we watch this whole video, you think you could, if we watch the whole thing, you think you can say, okay, that's the moment where my senses came to me and I decided I was going to tell this major lie? Mm, I, I, don't, I don't know that it happened like that, but I mean, I may be able to tell you some things that contributed to it. If we watched the whole thing. Yeah, we've heard that. I want to be clear, though. 
at least on this one, at some point during this interview, when you were able to plan your lie about this event. And you made that decision. Uh, but it wasn't what we just played. It wasn't yet. It was some point after that. I don't think that's a lie right there is, is the reason why I don't think that it's occurred before this because what I'm saying there, I, I believe to be truthful. And I know, I know this. I know for a fact that when David Owens asked me about my relationship with my wife and my child, I know that that played a role in that. And I believe that, and I may be wrong, but I believe that this was before that. You ever heard the expression, not telling the whole truth is the same as telling the lie? Sure I have. That's something you understood as a lawyer and a, and a prosecutor? Yes. <clears throat> All right. Um, state your full name for me, please. Richard Alexander Murdoch. <clears throat> and spell your last name so I get it correct. M U R D A U G H. Alright. And you go by Alec? Yes, sir. And date of birth, Mr. Murdoch? May 27th. 1968. Good phone number for you. 803-942-1227. All right, sir. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. stated I'm David Owen and I'm Laura Rutland with Tonkin County I'm a sled I hate to have to do this I understand yeah. I totally yeah. understand yeah. so you don't you don't have any problem yeah. with it so you hadn't decided to lie right there correct I don't believe so. Good luck with him, your comments. Let me know what you think about this uh, jury tampering allegations. Do you think that should have anything to do with his uh, conviction of uh, murdering his two um, family members, which is his wife? and his young son. Absolutely disgusting. Now, the evidence and the evidence did point to him being guilty. The jury found him guilty um, with overwhelming, overwhelming um, evidence. He lied in court. It was proven in court that he lied. The jury did not believe him. I think it should just be the clerk of the court being um, possibly charged or even put in prison for six months for her part in um, trying to persuade the jury to move in a different direction. But uh, the evidence in the court was overwhelming. Shout out to returning so subscribers. I do not think we also should the have new ones. Thank you very trial. much. Don't forget to hit that uh, subscribe button. Also share this video with your friends and family. It is said here, will this killer walk free? He's already been convicted of um, the murder of his son and his wife. Also, he's, he's also been convicted of um, stealing money from his partners and from his clients. But because he was convicted for murder, 
and this uh, clerk of the court is accused of jury tampering, tampering, I should say, he may walk free. We will keep watching this one.